Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome back to New Books in Law, a channel on the New Books Network. I'm Jane Richards, and today I'm speaking with Professor Michael C. Davis. Professor Michael C. Davis is in the in the fall of 2020 a visiting professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Hong Kong, where he teaches core courses on international human rights. He is also currently a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Centre for Scholars in Washington, D.C., a senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asia Institute at Columbia University, and a professor of law and international affairs at OP Jindal Global University in India. Michael C. Davis has written a number of books and many more articles, many of these about China, Hong Kong, and their politics and human rights. As a public intellectual and human rights advocate in Hong Kong, he was a founder of both the Article 23 Concern Group and the Article 45 Concern Group, which led massive protests for human rights in 2003 and 2004. Now, I first met Michael when he was my lecturer in the Masters of Human Rights Law program at the University of Hong Kong during the Occupy Central movement of 2014. Today, I'm thrilled to be speaking to Michael C. Davis about his latest book, Making Hong Kong China, The Rollback of Human Rights and the Rule of Law, published in 2020 by Columbia University Press. Michael C. Davis, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you, Jane. Happy to to be on it. We're happy to have you. Now, just to get started, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to write Making Hong Kong China, The Rollback of Human Rights and the Rule of Law. Well, I've been, as you your introduction showed, I've been involved with Hong Kong for many years. Uh, as a professor in Hong Kong, I eventually sort of became a public intellectual, uh, I think especially after the 2003 protest, uh, which I was one of the leaders uh, where we were trying to stop uh, enactment of a national security law in Hong Kong that uh, offended human rights in various ways. So th- th- that sort of led to uh, a more public persona. And so over the years, I'm, I'm frequently involved in media interviews and so on. And uh, I also write op-eds and commentary, even winning a, a, a Human Rights Press Award at one point for, for doing that. So I was sort of fully engaged, let's put it that way. And, and then uh, in the last few years, I've been working from abroad, but I, I continue to uh, do a regular bit on the local radio station and stuff and comment on public affairs in Hong Kong. Uh, last year, during the massive protest, I was uh, asked to write a report on Hong Kong, which I did. It was uh, a project at Georgetown University. It had uh, some participation as well with the uh, National Democratic Institute, which uh, the two of them came together to sort of fund this report. And so we had a trip to Hong Kong. We interviewed a lot of people, and the report was written and published in early 2020. Uh, so I had, a, a, during that trip, a lot of chance to talk to people and understand what the protest was all about and why they were all upset. Uh, and so when uh, this uh, national security law was pu- proposed uh, from Beijing in 2020, uh, I was thinking, well, I need to write something to comment on that because that's something that occurred after my uh, visit for the report and after the report was published. So I wanted to update all of that, and I was thinking of what kind of format to do it in that would reach the public and be understandable. Uh, you know, I wanted it to be a, uh, something that uh, general readers and ordinary people could understand, both in Hong Kong and overseas. Because if people don't understand what's going on up there overseas, then Hong Kong will lack the support it needs. So I settled on this idea of trying to write a not too long book that was, I hope, uh, reader friendly uh, for the general reader and at the same time informative for people who are policymakers or experts in the area. And so I did it. I started writing this book uh, at the beginning of July and published it in October. I, I really worked full time at it and wrote it uh, rather quickly because I, I, of course, very familiar with Hong Kong, so I can weave what's happening now uh, into the ongoing narrative about Hong Kong. And I do think you really achieve that in terms of um, it is really accessible to both an audience who may not be as familiar with all of the issues because, you know, over the past year there have been 
a year and a half, say, so many changes and it is really difficult to keep up. But I do think there's also a lot in there for experts and policymakers. So I'm I'm astounded. Like it's amazing that you wrote the book so quickly from July to October. It, it's it, it's pretty amazing. Um, but just in terms of like really you do really grab the readers and you you make us feel like we're there with you. So you open the book in a very powerful way. You write, imagine you live in a freewheeling city like New York or London, one of the world's leading financial, educational and cultural centres. Then imagine that one of the world's most infamous authoritarian regimes makes direct control over your city. Introducing secret police, warrantless surveillance and searches, massive repression and the arrest of protesters and aggressive prosecution. Now, for our listeners, can you expand on this a bit further? What happened in 2019 and what's happening now in 2020? Yes, I think, uh, you know, that requires, and I'm sure we're going to go into that, it requires uh, awareness that Hong Kong is operating under this one country, two systems framework. And the framework was designed, in effect, to protect Hong Kong uh, from the intrusion of the mainland system. Because in the 1980s, when uh, the agreement to return Hong Kong, what we call the Sino-British Treaty, or Joint Declaration, was signed, there was a recognition that China itself, just coming out of its own cultural revolution a a decade earlier, had a system that really was not up to the standard that Hong applied in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was already a global city, a major financial center, a major cultural center. It had the rule of law. It had basic freedoms. I'm not saying those freedoms were all intact during 140 years of colonial rule, but certainly after World War II, under the pressures of decolonization globally, uh, the British uh, rule uh, method of ruling Hong Kong Uh, largely adhered to the rule of law. It wasn't a democracy, so there was a recognition when they signed this agreement uh, that uh, there would have to be some kinds of reforms so that Hong Kong people could participate more fully in their governance. Uh, And so at the same time, there there was very clear uh, provisions both in the Sino-British Treaty and the, the basic law that followed. The basic law was uh, enacted in 1990, and it, it was the content of it was stipulated in the, in the Sino-British Joint Declaration, even though the Chinese uh, formed a drafting and a consultative committee to accomplish that. So the basic law itself has very strong language to protect Hong Kong from the intrusion of the mainland system. It was understood that was, in effect, the biggest threat to Hong Kong. Uh, and so uh, that's how Hong Kong was handed over. And in the early years, I think there was uh, at least some restraint on Beijing's part not to intrude so much in Hong Kong. Uh, And so it was kind of a slow drip, drip, more and more intrusion as time goes on. The democracy that Hong Kong needed wasn't there. Uh, And so the Hong Kong government that was in place is not one that really responds effectively to the public, but is more under the thumb of Beijing. So, so over the years, and in fact, in the book, I emphasize that over the years, there's a slow erosion of Hong Kong's autonomy. There are events along the way, like the Article 23 stuff that you mentioned when you introduced me that I was involved with. There are events where uh, the threat to Hong Kong's autonomy was heightened. Uh, this was heightened also when, when the government under Beijing's encouragement tried to institute patriotic education in 2012. Uh, And this kind of uh, challenge or confrontation occurred during an umbrella movement in 2014 and 15. But throughout all of this, I think there was at least the idea that the rule of law should be carefully guarded uh, and that the courts should be independent and final as is guaranteed in the in the basic law and as well in the joint declaration. So all of these, there was at least a feeling in Hong Kong that Hong Kong was different from the mainland. Uh, But what happened in 2019, I think, was a a very sharp turn in how popular protests were handled in Hong Kong, uh, with uh, the police uh, being quite severe uh, in their uh, ways of trying to repress the protests that were going on. 
and the, so the situation starts changing. It, it, there's a kind of feeling, I think, in the way the police behaved that uh, China was behind the scenes sort of guiding what was happening because it seemed kind of weird it, for Hong Kong people. In fact, the Hong Kong police, I think before the current uh, government of Carrie Lam, uh, who's now the chief executive, before she took over, uh, opinion polls showed that the police had something like 78% support uh, in Hong Kong society. So Hong Kong police were greatly respected. But by the time last year, and these, uh, their methods of trying to suppress the protest uh, ensued, uh, their uh, popularity rating went down to sort of 73% in one, one poll that was taken, disapproval. So this is, is uh, uh, the part of the reason why uh, their behavior seems to be out of, out of character. And so there's a sense, not just we didn't have to wait till 2020, and the national security law that we're going to talk about today. But by already in 2019, there's a sense that Beijing is taking over and that this autonomy of Hong Kong is under severe threat. Uh, and so there we have last year already police scenes in the media every day, reports, police uh, confronting uh, protesters. There's a, no sign that the government wants to listen to what the protesters are doing. Uh, are demanding, excuse me, uh, at one point in early June, there were a million protesters and then reportedly two million protesters on the street asking for the withdrawal. Uh, I mean, the init thing that initiated the protest was an extradition uh, law that was proposed so that protesters in quietly and nonviolent massive marches asking for withdrawal of that law, that uh, proposed bill, and the government would not listen at all. Uh, only after some kind of more confrontational tactics were used, uh, such as occupying the Legislative Council and so on, the government finally suspends that bill. But by then, it was too little, too late. And so the protesters added demands because they recognized that the problem they had was that they had a government that was more responsive to Beijing than it was to local Hong Kong core uh, concerns. And so... There are these further demands as the arrest ensued that the characterization that it be a riot would be uh, dropped, that th this would be their protest would be acknowledged as uh, sort of a valid citizen's action, uh, that they uh, that the charges against uh, <coughs> protesters be dismissed, and so on, and ultimately uh, that the police be investigated for their behavior. But all of these things were completely ignored. And I think, and then th th this, uh, the final demand was that the uh, promised democratic reform, that the discussion over that be reopened. There had been discussion over it in 2014-15, and the government had come up with nothing democratic. And so the protesters added that demand because I think in, in all of this, they saw that this government really is not guarding Hong Kong's autonomy. And if it fails to do so, Hong Kong core values would be threatened. The rule of law would be threatened. Uh, and this, you know, when opinion polls are taken in Hong Kong, the rule of law, that is that everyone's subject to the law, that the courts are independent, that the officials don't have undue influence on how the law is enforced, and so on, that all of this, these characteristics of the rule of law have always been at the top of Hong Kong core values. So I think the, the average person in the street in Hong Kong and the protesters understand this, and they understand that Hong Kong's autonomy depends on a, having a government willing to defend it, and that the, the rule of law depends on this autonomy. So I'm saying this is what's sort of going on. We're seeing this intrusion of these harsh tactics of the government ignoring the people of protesters being arrested, all of these things are going on that seem out of character. In, a, in an open society, the government should be more responsive to the people. And I think this is at the heart of the demand that has, t has always been in, uh, at the top of the list in Hong Kong, and that is that there be democratic reform. So all of this is going on. And of course, by the time you asked the question about last year, by the time we get to this year, uh, the intrusion of the mainland system is even greater. 
I'm wondering if you can just give us, um, you touched briefly on, for example, the Sino-British Declaration and the basic law um, and this idea of one country and two systems model. You've also mentioned that it's been eroded, There's, you know, it's been a gradual process, but especially in the last year or so. So I'm wondering what is, you know, from a legal perspective, a political perspective, what is Beijing's commitment under this model? Perhaps framing yeah, it in well, relation, yeah. Yeah, I, this is a very good question. You know, in, in, in response to what you asked previously, I was trying to get past it as quickly as possible. But it is worth dwelling on it. And in the book, I try to do that. I actually, in the first uh, introduction, I talk about the sign of British Treaty. And in the next chapter, I go into the basic law, because that's at the heart of everything. Uh, for listeners in countries with constitutions and written constitutions and democracy, it would be familiar to them that a constitution is always at the heart of public debate, of politics. Okay, It's something that people uh, always have contestation over. And, and so in Hong Kong, this is the case as well. So the, the joint declaration was signed, and more or less it provides, uh, I think I counted them, 16 different rights that are to be protected in Hong Kong. But it's interesting to me that of those 16, about eight of them relate to free press or free speech in one form or another. So it's a kind of very, you know, just by its heavy weighting towards freedoms and basic freedoms uh, and otherwise towards the rule of law, it's a very liberal commitment that was made to Hong Kong. Uh, while the Chinese government sometimes uh, pushes back against this characterization, it's hard to read the joint declaration of the basic law without concluding that. Uh, so it, that was a vision that would, in effect, create a community or establish a constitutional community that would be capable of ruling itself and guarding its basic freedoms and rule of law. So that is kind of what, what the content of that is. And it's expressed in many ways in those 16 different rights. The joint declaration had them. They were stipulated for inclusion in the basic law, and they're there. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights was stipulated uh, for inclusion in the basic law, and it is provided for in Article 39 of the basic law. Uh, so that any kind of rights violation, in effect, as interpreted by the courts in Hong Kong, and, and there they're exercising their rule of law function, uh, when they've interpreted, they essentially are saying, uh, that any uh, that that Hong Kong has to adhere to the ICCPR, and that any behavior, whether it be legislation or official behavior, that violates that uh, would be uh, uh, challenged, could be challenged in the courts, and held invalid if it if it is a law. Uh, and so this this kind of rule of law uh, liberal model uh, is clearly provided there, but it, the basic law doesn't stop there. It goes on uh, in a probably a, an attitude of even greater caution and provides expressly that mainland laws will not apply in Hong Kong, that the only mainland laws that would apply would be ones that would be listed in Annex 3 of the basic law. So that, that's one way to keep the mainland system out. But it goes further in another article and provides that even mainland officials cannot interfere in local matters. That is... May, they say mainland departments under the central government should not interfere in local matters. So uh, when you put all this together, it's hard to imagine it is anything uh, other. And, and I should add here before I make that point that it also guarantees that the ultimate aim in Hong Kong is universal suffrage, both to choose the joint, uh, the chief executive and the legislative council. So that's the ultimate aim. It provides that this will be a process of gradual and orderly progress, but the ultimate aim is that. So with democracy, rule of law, and basic freedoms all guaranteed at high global standards, and at the same time a high degree of autonomy promised, and mainland officials uh, admonished not to interfere in local matters that are within the autonomy of the region, uh, then Hong Kong look pretty secure. And I think a lot of people in Hong Kong at least wanted to have confidence in this. So, but at the same time, they become very much conscious of the risk to this 
uh, if the mainland starts intruding too much. Now, the basic law provides that mainland does have power when it comes to a local central relations, that it, it can define those, uh, the boundaries of that, and that when it comes to exercising uh, defense or foreign affairs. And this is a kind of standard uh, arrangement that exists elsewhere in the world when countries, uh, small countries, sometimes are aligned with larger countries. They may surrender some of this authority to the larger country just as a matter of, of resources. But in the case of China, of course, they saw that as an expression of Chinese sovereignty. So you have now some guarantees of one country, the sovereignty of the Chinese government, and some guarantees of two systems. What happens over time, what the risk is, with such strong guarantees, it's hard to deny they exist, that two systems uh, is also to be secure. But over time, one country seems to gobble up two systems uh, at every turn. And I think one of the things I wanted to do in the book that I thought would be a, a contribution beyond just uh, criticizing uh, these recent developments is to highlight that this erosion of these guarantees takes place over 23 years. It's not something, it just ratchets up its speed and intensity in these last couple of years, as, as that first paragraph you read suggests. Then suddenly, uh, a society that was pretty much like New York uh, starts looking a bit too much like an authoritarian regime. I guess maybe then it is a good time to go back to, for example, 2003, um, and you were directly involved in some of the protests at that point. I think it might help listeners to understand, to contextualise what's happened and what's been sped up specifically. Um, maybe you can just talk a little bit about what you did then and then we can move on to, like, the recent developments. Okay. Well, what happened? I think 2003, uh, if I could just... Pr- uh, add a preface to it. Uh, in 1999, for the first time, one of the provisions in the basic law says if a case comes up before the court of final appeal that involves local central relations or matter of central authority, that the matter would be referred to the, to the uh, National People's Congress Standing Committee for interpretation of, of the basic law requirement there. Uh, and a case came up quickly because Hong Kong had uh, enacted uh, laws that denied the right of abode to certain children of Hong Kong and so on. And this was challenged un- in the courts. And the Court of Final Appeals said in-, in its ruling that this was not a matter involving local central relations. And even though the government wanted the matter referred to the NPC Standing Committee, the court refused to do so. And in that case, the government then ran around the court, even though the basic law doesn't mention the government referring anything to the standing committee. The government did so, and the standing committee allowed it, and effectively the ruling of the court in the case was overturned. Uh, the parties to the case, there's technical legal aspects where it doesn't affect them, but it affects the law of the case, as lawyers would understand it. And so this, what it did is put in place a kind of signal that, remains over the head of the courts in Hong Kong, that if the standing committee doesn't like what they're doing, that it could overrule them. And so whenever sensitive cases come up, this sort of uh, is one area where there's a, a, a bit of peril for the Hong Kong's rule of law system. Uh, and, and the courts so far over these years have stood their ground. So I think it's important to know that preface because that's where the rule of law gets implicated. And so what happened in 2003, there's another article in the basic law, Article 23, which says that the local Hong Kong government shall enact laws on national security involving state secrets and this kind of thing on its own. And even that was part of, I didn't mention earlier, but it was part of this idea that Hong Kong would be truly autonomous, that a mainland national security law would not be imposed on Hong Kong, but rather Hong Kong would enact its own law. And it was obliged to do that. Uh, And so the government proposed this law. But instead of, and I should say, as a footnote here, Hong Kong uh, inherited from its colonial period much of the law that would satisfy this requirement already. Uh, It had laws on secrecy and and other kinds of of behavior that fall under the heading of national security. So 
uh, there was no urgency to enact the law. And, and some of the old laws from the colonial period actually would rather draconian. And so perhaps the, the, most, the best spirit of enacting national security law would have been for the government to approach it in an attitude of reform, of trying to make the laws consistent because the old colonial laws were enacted before the Bill of Rights in Hong Kong was enacted. And the Bill of Rights, I should add, is a photocopy of the ICCPR. So it was enacted in Hong Kong to comply with the joint declarations guarantee and, and with the government of Hong Kong's commitment under the ICCPR. So the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, in effect is, becomes the Bill of Rights of Hong Kong. But this only came into existence in early 1990s. So a lot of the laws on national security are related to this issue were enacted before that. So the government could have approached all of this in a reform spirit to comply with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But instead, they came up with a bill proposal that they that would, uh, uh, in many ways, offend those guarantees, uh, have a bit of heavy handedness by police, imposing restraints on the press, and so on. So, so this proposal, uh, nine of us sat down in a room one day with this proposal in hand, and, and we were all uh, lawyers, or uh, two of us were law professors, uh, Johannes Chan and myself, uh, and we sat down in, in this room and thought, oh, well, we should try to push back against this because this is not an acceptable law. Now, at the time, the government was in a kind of attitude, as, as, as uh, my previous comments would suggest, of not paying too much attention to what Hong Kong people wanted, but basically thinking it can do whatever it wants, uh, and certainly not, uh, uh, you know, trying to move towards the dem promised democratic reform. So we thought when we uh, started talking about uh, doing something and writing something or trying to respond, we thought at best we might make the law so unpopular, at least they wouldn't dare to use it. Uh, but we had underestimated the, the, the response from Hong Kong people. And so we wrote a bunch of pamphlets. Uh, there was nine of us, so we wrote nine pamphlets. I wrote one, and my colleagues, I, I can say as a footnote here, these colleagues later formed what is now the, the Civic Party. Uh, and so th those were my colleagues. So we wrote this, these pamphlets, and we distributed them on the street. I think we had about a half a million of them. They were printed just one side in English, the other side in Chinese, a single sheet of paper folded three times, and we distributed it on the street. Uh, it, they were in different colors, each pamphlet, so people started calling them the rainbow pamphlets. And when we distributed it, we're standing outside of MTR, you know, this uh, mass transit rail stations, handing out handbills, sometimes getting rather suspicious looks from people as we try to shove a piece of paper in their face. As, as you could imagine. But nonetheless, they were all distributed. We held press conferences. Uh, and actually, Hong Kong people uh, understood the concern. And before this was over, a half a million of them protested on the street. Uh, one of the, Eventually, the government was still going to push the, this law through. Uh, but just before the, the final push, one of the pro-establishment parties, the Liberal Party, decided it wasn't going to do something that was so unpopular that so many protesters opposed. And so it withdrew its support from the bill and the bill failed. So this was one thing, uh, two things that I've just highlighted here. One is that the rule of law is put at risk by the way the government handled those right of abode case. So the public is very much alert. You know, this government may not be defending our rule of law in the way we would like or defend our autonomy in the way we'd like. It went to Beijing to overrule the court. And then along comes this national security proposal that threatens rights and, and so on. And again, the government doesn't seem that uh, concerned with the, the, the concerns raised by the public. In fact, it was going to push the bill through until one of its own party supporting parties withdrew its support. So I think this was the education of Hong Kong people on they, and the fact that they won in regard to the Article 23, that the bill was withdrawn told them that they're the ones that are going to have to guard their national, I mean, excuse me, have to guard their autonomy uh, and the rule of law and their core values in Hong Kong. 
that they're not going to be able to stand back and rely on the government to do that. And I think ever since, uh, these lessons have been learned in Hong Kong, and these lessons explain uh, the political history that follows. Now, I think that's really interesting. So you just said that the the what people learned in 2003 is that they couldn't rely on the government to protect Hong Kong's autonomy, the rule of law, and the rights and freedoms in uh, the basic law and also the Bill of Rights. So what we see is then over time there's this, you know, sort of increased education of civil society. So, for example, 2003 protests that you just spoke about, 2012 scholarism protests, Occupy Central Movement, and all of these were, you know, largely civil disobedience movement. Now, in this book, you write that the message is clear. When Beijing is calling the shots, as is especially the case with democratic reform, nonviolent mass protests have not worked. When the matter was left to the local government, sufficient public pressure would sometimes produce results as the government might worry about its image. By 2019, this recognition of the difficulty of promoting democratic reform with Beijing would inspire an unfortunate degree of youthful cynicism with respect to nonviolent strategies. Now, I'd say in some ways, you know, this point might be somewhat controversial. Now, for example, there's research by Chenoweth and Stevens that have argued that nonviolent resistance has been more than twice as effective as their violent counterparts in achieving their stated goals. But if we look at the protests in Hong Kong historically, and especially in 2019, and we situate this in years-long peaceful struggle for democratic reform, now, it could be argued that Hong Kong is in the one-third where peaceful civil resistance failed. Um, there's somewhat of an irony to this, especially looking at Occupy Central, which was characterised by its discipline and adherence to peaceful resistance, and it didn't achieve its basic, its stated goal of universal suffrage. I mean, one might ask, what else could people do? Now, Obviously, you're not condoning violent struggle here, but I'm wondering if you would comment further on the situation in Hong Kong and particularly in any failure of either peaceful struggle or attempts by legislators to work within the legislative system? Oh, this is, of course, a huge problem in Hong Kong. Uh, we can all remember when the youngsters first uh, invaded the legislative council chamber and engaged in some vandalism there. One of the posters that they stuck up on the wall uh, for the government <laughs> to read was you taught us that nonviolence doesn't work. So at that point, there, the very immediate lesson they are describing was that first one million protesters marched in, in June uh, 9th, I think it was, and then on June 16th, uh, two million, which is, a, a, you know, Hong Kong has about 7.5 million people. That's a high percentage of the population actually on the street protesting. Uh, and the government still would not even suspend the uh, extradition bill, right? So, so that this is the lesson they're describing. Uh, and yet, uh, it is true when they start using a, a kind of climbing over fences at the legislative council. I, I wouldn't characterize it as violence as much as a kind of vandalism. Uh, maybe some I don't recall whether there were some rocks thrown or bricks or anything at the time. But anyhow, it's a more intense uh, strategy uh, that involves breaking into to the legislative chamber. And then soon after that, the bill, extradition bill, is suspended. Uh, so it seems indeed that uh, they got more out of that violent tactic. Uh, and so I call that in the book, and I view it as worrisome, because what it says is you have a government uh, that's non-responsive to obvious concerns of the public. And so you ask why? Uh, and my, my observation of over these many years, because I've been in Hong Kong for more than 30 years, uh, my observation was at several times when the public was deeply incensed, the government got it, maybe reluctantly, but it did withdraw the Article 23 legislation uh, eventually, so public protest, nonviolent, it was all nonviolent, uh, worked. Uh, and then when the, the attempt, uh, there was an attempt to impose this national education, as they called it, 
uh, which the, the youngsters called brainwashing and scholarism that was led by Joshua Wong and others, uh, Agnes Chow, uh, that there again, when, the, when there was this deep uh, expression of concern, it was withdrawn. Uh, but, you know, after the Article 23 protest a year later in 2004, equally large protests uh, occurred. Uh, and over democracy, that they wanted the promised democratic reform to be put in in place. Uh, and that was completely rejected in spite of the large protest. So one got, the, and that required Beijing's approval in effect. And so it seemed that when Beijing doesn't approve, then the uh, nonviolent protest uh, simply does not work. Uh, but because the nonviolent protest did work in those other two cases I mentioned, there was a kind of education of the public that this street protest was, was a battle for the hearts and minds of the people of Hong Kong. And if you won that battle, that you might get the result that you're looking for. Uh, but when it, it appeared that, that the government didn't have its hands were tied or it couldn't do otherwise, then you would not get it. Uh, and so that, that's a very difficult situation I think Hong Kong faces even now. Uh, how can it get these areas of deep concern addressed? Now, of course, under the national security law, the risk has, has gone up dramatically and Beijing seems to be directly in charge of everything. So, so this is the, the, the dilemma for Hong Kong. Why Chenoweth and others argue nonviolence works better because in a nonviolent movement, whether it's over certain limited issues or a revolution, uh, entire revolution, when the protests are over, the sides can usually work together better because they, they haven't been, you know, in such a uh, intense competition. Uh, and, and the urge of the new government or the new uh, administration uh, will be to handle matters in a peaceful way and and not resort to violence because violence becomes a kind of habit. But Hong Kong is in a peculiar case where the government that they're trying to persuade is, is uh, hundreds of miles away. Uh, and they, Hong Kong people on the street, pose very little threat to that government. Well, protest in some ways involves an element of persuasion and sometimes uh, an element of, of threat to, to a local government uh, which encourages the government to listen. Uh, but in this case, the Hong Kong people don't have, the, they, they, they're, the, whatever uh, threat they oppose in terms of public opinion doesn't reach Beijing. So I think this, this is a, kind of embedded in the basic law itself, the way it's set up and the way Beijing uh, manages it by empowering its friends in Hong Kong uh, sort of what we call a united front approach that China uses. China, this is a common term to describe how China governs, uh, rewarding its friends and punishing its enemies in effect and trying to get as many friends as it can, but at the same time uh, targeting those people who oppose the government. Uh, and I think they've kind of been doing that in a sort of slow motion in Hong Kong, even before the handover they identify all the pro-Beijing people they like and pro-establishment. They co-opt the business community and everything. So they have all these people uh, that they designate to rule Hong Kong as opposed to allowing democracy to flourish. And, and they tend to disapprove of and target the, those people in opposition. But in Hong Kong, the opposition outnumbers the uh, government supporters. And so they, they, these people that are in the government camp, we can let's call in the pro-establishment camp, they tend to dance to Beijing's tune, and they're not sufficiently sensitive to the concerns of Hong Kong people. What we would like to see, I think, even during this period before full democracy is established, is that these pro-establishment figures would use their voice to convey to Beijing what Hong Kong concerns are. Uh, and if that had been happening, the chances are that Beijing would be more at ease with the things that happen in an open society because the pro-establishment camp and the, and the government itself 
would serve an intermediary role between Hong Kong people and Beijing. Well, that I think has been the biggest failure of the one country, two systems framework as Beijing carries it out. Uh, that these officials, uh, apparently they think they, they get their appointments and their rewards and their position by showing and demonstrating their loyalty to Beijing. Uh, and so this makes them apparently, I'm just guessing, reluctant to share their concerns. I mean, many of them surely understand what an open society is. They grew up in one. Uh, they understand what the rule of law is, and, and they understand why human rights are important. Uh, but I, I think they fail to effectively convey that. And so that intermediate role was never filled. And as a result, the public keeps increasing. It's you know, trying to put pressure on them and, and they serve Beijing by trying to repress opposition. And so you kind of have Newton's law in place where the more repression that is imposed, the more resistance you get until you get to the situation we have today where Beijing completely does not trust Hong Kong, does not even trust Hong Kong institutions. So I, if I had to point my finger at a, at a, a real failure in terms of how people... Uh, participate in this one country, two systems model, I think I would especially uh, address my concern to the pro-establishment camp, which I feel has failed to adequately uh, find its voice to represent Hong Kong instead of just representing Beijing to Hong Kong. I think that's very interesting. And then, so... Picking up on that point, this failure of representing or conveying Hong Kong's interests to Beijing and acting as this intermediary, what we've seen in the last probably 18 months is a speeding up of, of control from the mainland over Hong Kong. For example, you write about there's been targeted arrests, there's been political exclusions and expulsions, you know, the expansion of powers of the Beijing Liaison, liaison Office, co-opting of the public sector. Um and then you also write that as the 2019 protests wore on, it was now clear to the protesters the government was pursuing a policy of official violence to quell all protests and assert control on the government's terms. I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit more about specifically what has, ha what has happened in 2019 and 2020, perhaps with some examples. Oh, yes. It's, it's actually a, a rather... Uh, uh, dramatic, I, I would say, uh, increase in repression in Hong Kong. And also, in line with what I just commented, I would say an increase in indifference of Hong Kong officials uh, to uh, what uh, Hong Kong people have been concerned about all these years. Uh, I think uh, this level of indifference took shape, especially under the prior a CY Lung administration, but it hasn't receded. It's actually increased, I think, under Carrie Lam. So the government seems to view its relationship with the opposition as a hostile one and one that they aim to control. Uh, and so in 2019, when these protests started over the extradition bill, and, and it's interesting because why would Carrie Lam, the chief executive now, uh, propose uh, this extradition bill uh, uh, when uh, she already had a history of experience uh, with uh, the Article 23 proposals uh, a decade, uh, well, I guess more than a decade earlier, uh, and that the, she, she was surely aware of the public's concern. So some people speculate that she thought, well, the concern about uh, this kind of thing had died down. Uh, uh, the Dem you know, they, the, the government apparently felt that it won uh, the, the contest during the umbrella movement in 2014 and 15 because all this occupation of the street uh, resulted in no democratic reform, that they had managed to stop it. And at the same time, they were prosecuting some of the leaders of that, that movement uh, such that they may have had an a unrealistic sense that, yeah, we can pretty much do what we want 
and get away with it because things, the protests that die down, I was a frequent uh, commentator on the developments during the umbrella movement. So I was virtually on that street, uh, I'd say every day, uh, trying to, uh, usually doing interviews and stuff and trying to explain uh, for international media what was going on and, and also for local media as well. Uh, and uh, so one of the things I observed as time went on when the street was occupied for 79 days, there were fewer and fewer people there in the tents. So I, I think the government may have concluded, well, we kind of won that and now we're going to prosecute people and we're going to win. And so Carrie, uh, Carrie Lam, of course, wants to please Beijing and Beijing has been waiting for this Article 23 legislation again, to a new try at it. Uh, and so maybe she thought, well, let's try with an extradition bill. If this goes through quietly, uh, then maybe we, we can uh, go back and revisit the Article 23 legislation. So the extradition bill would have sent people to, uh, it would have allowed the arrest in Hong Kong of uh, local people and foreigners as well. Uh, for violation of mainland laws, uh, criminal violations of mainland laws, they could be extradited. There were a few areas where they, they were not supposed to be extradited over like a political crimes or something, uh, but that's a kind of a vague term and there are sufficient other crimes <laughs> that you could uh, uh, nab uh, protesters under if you wanted to send them to the mainland. And at the same time, the extradition bill would reach, uh, you know, financial improprieties of various types, corruption and so on. And the business community was even opposed to it. Uh, so to Carrie Lam's surprise, the opposition uh, became quite dramatic that Hong Kong's rule of law was clearly threatened if Hong Kongers could be shipped off to the mainland and tried, where the rule of law clearly does not apply. Uh, and so that, that was the contest. And the, the street protest uh, ensued, and the end result was uh, after, as I mentioned already, the, the bill would be suspended and then later uh, withdrawn. But still, I think uh, this left the public, uh, uh, you know, very dissatisfied. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Carrie Lam probably learned her lesson and not going to be able to promote Article 23 legislation. So what we have uh, when these protests in 2019 eventually die down and all this kind of police abuse and everything uh, that people were concerned about was never addressed, uh, protests died down largely because of the pandemic. And, uh, and then the government at that point, I think a few months actually uh, of quiet, relative quiet, uh, could have perhaps, uh, you know, started talking to the opposition about how to uh, resolve the issues and concerns that people had, but that wasn't done. Rather, it starts arresting and prosecuting people, more and more people, and it targets. Uh, it's interesting because in 2019, the old, older guard of the pan-democracy movement in Hong Kong were not the leaders. This was more led by a younger, new generation. And a lot of the elders of the democracy movement, even the father of the democracy movement, Martin Lee, in fact, were while they weren't condemning all the protests and they agreed with the demands of the protesters, they advocated nonviolence. And yet, when the government starts prosecuting a people uh, after, after these protests, it actually targets some of these older uh, what you might consider the Beijing's enemies from old. Uh, so it seems like a very targeted approach. Uh, instead of going after someone who actually engaged in some violent act on the street, uh, there was more emphasis on getting these uh, older uh, protesters. Uh, and so they, they ch level charges against Martin Lee for uh, unauthorized assembly. They are particularly going after a publisher of the leading opposition newspaper, the Apple Daily, Jimmy Lai. Uh, they uh, arrest him and his two sons and several of his executives in his company. Uh, and then they have this massive, uh, you know, uh, police invasion of his uh, newspaper to, in, to look for documents and so on. So all of these kind of uh, arrests are occurring in 2020, 
and, and instead of trying to listen and, and engage with the public on areas of concern, we're seeing the opposite. And of course, the biggest one, well, the national security law was not passed in Hong Kong under Article 23. Beijing resolves to impose it. So there's two things that are, are sort of emerging here. One is it looked like in 2019, Beijing had strong influence over the government's policies in responding to the protest and particularly how the police behaved in their aggressive manner uh, of addressing the protest. And then Beijing takes a direct hand in Hong Kong by proposing this national security law. Uh, and then, uh, well, one of the things that's said when they propose the national security law is that, well, it will only reach a few, uh, I guess you could use the term bad apples, a few of the more extreme people that all ordinary Hong Kong people not, need not worry. Uh, but that quickly becomes nonsense as, as the law is uh, enacted on 11 p.m. on June 30th. Uh, and the very first day, they start arresting people who were protesting. Uh, and then the arrest of Jimmy Lai that I just mentioned was actually under this law as well. He's uh, apparently accused of some kind of collusion uh, with foreign forces and other things. Uh, I, I imagine the... Uh, the uh, entry into his newspaper uh, management office and, and newsroom uh, was probably a fishing expedition. I think around 200 police were reported there grabbing documents. Uh, recently, they've even done so, I think, at his apartment or house. Uh, and so it's kind of looking for things that they can go after him for. And one gets the sense, the way they're targeting the old guard in many of these arrests, even when it's not the national security law, they're targeted under public order laws of various types, that uh, Beijing is out to get people that oppose it. Uh, and of course, they don't stop with that. The, the government starts initiating action to disqualify legislators or disqualify even candidates uh, from running for the legislative council uh, to uh, ex expel legislators who uh, did something they didn't like uh, uh, maybe in their swearing-in ceremony, uh, and and so on. And and just this past week, uh, arresting a, a number of legislators for a kind of brawl that ensued in the Legislative Council, all the, all the runs being arrested being from the pan-democratic camp, the opposition camp. Uh, and, and so it doesn't seem like, uh, I mean, it's not just the national security law, but now the national security law seems to be operating in tandem with these public order laws and laws on rioting and sedition. So they're all sort of pulled together. Uh, and if the, the act in question is before the enactment of the national security law, then they will use charges like sedition or rioting or something. If it's after the national security law, then they may combine these kind of charges with violations of the national security law. So it just seems that uh, and the people being arrested uh, so many of them being from the old old guard, older, you know, more established uh, uh, pan-democratic activists, that that they're probably targeting these people that they that are enemies in their view. And so, just picking up on this idea of the crackdown under the national security law, um, and bringing these sort of points together of you know this increased repression. Can you talk a little about specifically what kind of conduct the national security law criminalizes, um, the impacts since its implementation, and whether or not you feel that Hong Kong's autonomy has any hope of being preserved with the national security law in operation? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it seems very little hope. I think there's a sense of hopelessness in Hong Kong. You'll, you'll recall in the book I kind of articulate a, a, one thread that I expand upon throughout the book is the evolution of Hong Kong from a state of hopefulness to trepidation and hopelessness and fear. Uh, and I think we're at the latter stage now of mostly fear and hopelessness about the future of Hong Kong. The national security law comes in at the end of this very horrendous uh, a crackdown in 2019 uh, as a kind of further crackdown on Hong Kong. Uh, and what happens is now those articles in the basic law that said mainland departments 
should not interfere in local matters have largely been discarded, okay? Uh, they did this initially before the national security law by having issuing statements uh, from uh, the uh, head, you know, uh, various officials. There's a local liaison office and there's a Hong Kong and Macau affairs office, okay? Uh, and so th these offices, one uh, located in Beijing and one in Hong Kong, sort of representing Beijing's uh, interest, the liaison office, they, they were saying, well, these offices are accepted from this rule. Uh, the officials were saying that mainland of, uh, departments not interfere in local affairs. Of course, that was putting the writing on the wall because that's kind of saying, well, when we want mainland officials to interfere in local affairs, uh, the, and they, the way the basic law words it is mainland departments under the central government. But when we want those departments to interfere, then we will say that's accepted. And so uh, that writing on the wall proved uh, right that, in fact, uh, what happened when the national security law is enacted, that it directly uh, in, in, enlists mainland officials in a whole range of areas respecting Hong Kong. Uh, the, it's hard to overestimate the reach of, of this national security law. So there's two sides to, to the story if, to make it as, as succinct as possible. One are the acts that are forbidden, uh, that, that are criminalized, and these are secession, uh, subversion, uh, activity, terrorist activities, and collusion. Uh, all of these are poorly defined in the national security law. If we applied the ICCPR, normally you would expect that any kind of subversion or secession would have to be, uh, you know, imminent. It, it couldn't uh, involve imminent action and not simply people talking. Uh, uh, you know, when there's not been a real uh, independence movement in, in Hong Kong of any substance, it's usually a, a, a pre kind of a fringe uh, group that, that's more or less in some sense, it becomes like a polemic because uh, most Hong Kong people uh, are prudent and they know the chances of Hong Kong gaining independence are, are slim. So the support for that kind of move is, is not that strong, just a, as a practical matter. It's something like in Taiwan, where people, uh, you know, kind of support the status quo because uh, being able to secure uh, in, a, in the way they would like, a kind of independence may be viewed by many people as out of reach. Okay, so so this is uh, is is I think the problem. So so what what Hong Kong people are doing is they're they uh, you know they're they're facing this kind of uh, situation uh, where mainland officials now are are saying that virtually any opposition could be characterized as some kind of subversion or collusion. Uh, and it's not just statements coming out of them. I mean, statements have occurred. When Hong Kong opposition camp held a primary election, sort of like they do in the United States before they choose a party chooses candidates, the opposition camp wanted to use this method to choose candidates. Uh, and 610,000 Hong Kong voters voted in this. Uh, the chief executive of Hong Kong and mainland officials said this was uh, in violation of the national security law. So the idea that national security law is narrowly applied obviously isn't very narrow if it applies to all 610,000 voters in that, in that activity. Uh, and then at the same time, they, the officials uh, in areas that are not, where criminal law is not yet being applied, are saying that the schools in Hong Kong have to change their curriculum to a more pro-Beijing curriculum and eliminate things that are uh, viewed as, uh, you know, the, that might be interpreted as violating a very vaguely defined uh, law against subversion. So again, all, all the schools in Hong Kong are affected by that. So again, saying it only applies narrowly is out. And then, of course, in the criminal area, the number of arrests, the people that are targeted sometimes, uh, Jimmy Lai being one of them, Agnes Chow, others, these people, uh, you know, again, it, it's not just a narrow crust of people that are out there, you know, 
uh, using force or something to secure independence, but it's it is really just people who are using their free speech to uh, express opposition to the government. Uh, and, and then we see arrests sometimes of over extraordinary things. I mean, just overnight, uh, a, a journalist for the local public broadcaster what was arrested allegedly, uh, and it's not clear exactly this morning what happened, I guess overnight from where I'm sitting uh, during the, the day in Hong Kong, it's not even clear. It's apparently he was taking down license numbers and representing something on a government website as to what the journalist was doing in a way the police said was false. So, uh, I mean, it's such a trivial matter that it's clearly targeting the media. Uh, they, the journalist was involved in covering uh, a kind of uh, uh, attack by thugs in a, a district of Hong Kong called Yen Long last year and it was trying to understand who was behind it and was looking at license tags of cars parked nearby and trying to figure that out. This, this journalist was doing that. I mean, that's journalism. <laughs> it's, uh, so this is an extreme case of, of how far they're going and trying to arrest people. Uh, it wouldn't be under the national security law. It would be under its partner, the local public order laws or something of this nature. So uh, this week they've arrested, uh, I think now, eight legislators for fighting in the Legislative Council. So, I mean, the opposition is under attack, uh, and, and I don't think it's enough to just look at the national security law in isolation and these four crimes, but to look at it in tandem with uh, other crimes regarding public order in Hong Kong. And I should say the basic law says the local government is to maintain public order, not Beijing. So all of this is going together and creating an atmosphere of, of repression. So that's one side of it, those laws themselves and how they relate to other local laws of similar nature uh, that could be used against the opposition. And then the second side of it are the institutions that are put in play. Now there's no pretense that Beijing doesn't directly interfere in Hong Kong. Under the national security law, there's a committee on safeguarding national security headed by the chief executive and staffed by various uh, cabinet officers and uh, uh, police-related, uh, prosecution-related officers. And this committee is to operate in secret on guarding national security, and its, its decisions are not subject to judicial review. The national security law makes that expressed. Uh, it's not, they're, they're, they're allowed to do what they want. And uh, the committee has a, a mainland advisor on national security, and that advisor has been appointed. It's the head of the local liaison office. And so uh, at the same time, this committee is to answer to the central people's government. Uh, so this committee on safeguarding national security has an advisor from the central people's government. Uh, and one would question just how much authority does this advisor have? In effect, I, I, generally in Hong Kong, the view is this advisor has now become the supervisor. Uh, and, and because uh, of it is, he is the voice of, of the central people's government to which the committee is subordinate. But it doesn't stop there. They create an office for safeguarding national security, which is entirely staffed by mainland officials. And this office is not even subject to local jurisdiction at all. So the idea of Hong Kong's autonomy uh, is, is decimated by this. There, there's a central government office to be staffed by mainland public security officers and state security officers uh, operating in Hong Kong. When I used the reference to secret police, I especially had this in mind. Although even the local police now have a special bureau set up to guard national security. Uh, and so when their actions are also perhaps uh, covered by the same uh, requirement of secrecy. And even the prosecution, the, the Department of Justice in Hong Kong has a special branch now to, to prosecute these national security cases. So if national security can be so broad as to include even, uh, you know, uh, conducting a primary uh, or, or whatever, uh, uh, you know, you can imagine that that could be uh, called collusion, for example, with foreigners, 
I mean, supporting an ad in a newspaper to stand with Hong Kong might be viewed as collusion with foreigners. And one wonders, you know, even uh, I gave a talk to the Law Society in Hong Kong via Zoom, and pro-Beijing figures there, uh, Maria Tam and Elsie Lung were there. And I asked them, I said, well, you know, the subversion law says that uh, it would be subversion if you act in a way to cause contempt of the government or hatred towards the government, or you, you cause people to feel that. Uh, so if I engage in the criticism that's in my book expressly at this meeting, are you colluding with me as a foreigner uh, in, in this regard? And I am a, a local resident of Hong Kong, but I'm also a foreigner. So uh, th this is where these things intersect, the process. Who's going to decide that? Uh, it's not clear. And the national security law goes further. It even says that the chief executive will choose a special list of judges to hear national security cases. Okay, uh, And again, it goes further and says that if a judge makes a statement that violates national security uh, or takes action that threatens national security, then the judge will be dismissed from the list. Uh, and how would a judge make a statement that threatens national security? Well, the most obvious thing that a judge would do, because judges are adhering to a code of ethics that keep them out of local politics, presumably the judge's statement would be in a judgment in court or in a ruling in court, uh, expressed openly in court. Uh, and in that context, then what, what should a judge say in court? Or would a judge get in trouble or lose their position uh, if they uh, rule against what mainland officials or Hong Kong officials want? And this is not just speculation because the judges in Hong Kong are now under attack. Uh, the ones that are dismissing these cases, mostly in the area of public order, uh, are uh, being attacked in the mainland press in, in, uh, by pro-Beijing figures. Uh, there's suggestions that they be dismissed from their jobs because they ruled against uh, what the prosecution wanted them to do. Uh, and so you create a kind of uh, system of fear to try to uh, bring the judiciary under control. It's clear from this special list and from these attacks that mainland officials view the local Hong Kong judiciary as a problem. And they want to uh, encourage it to be more compliant with their wishes uh, in in terms of how it uh, the courts handle opposition figures that are brought before the court. So this is uh, I think the, the the idea that this national security law has only a narrow focus on a few bad apples is uh, completely off the mark. It's very much reshaping the very character of the Hong Kong government. In the book, I argue, in effect, Hong Kong's basic law and national security law effectively now combined as the constitution of Hong Kong. And, and, and I argue, because it makes sense to me, and we'll see when this gets tested in courts, that in effect, if the national security law, uh, as, as applied, violates a provision of the basic law, uh, or is in conflict with the provision of the basic law, that the national security law will take priority over the basic law. Now, national security law in Article 4 says it's going to uphold all these rights and everything. But when you consider uh, all of these provisions and these institutions created, it's hard to see how uh, the, uh, these rights are going to be upheld in the face of, of the situation uh, that, that I've just described. It, that it, it seems that uh, there's, there's no institutional way for this to be handled. I see. Um, and now what I'd like to do is I'm wondering if you can put all that's going on in Hong Kong, um, in the Hong Kong situation, in the wider political situation of the region. Now, you write that there's been speculation that Beijing introduced the national security law along with aggressive moves in the South China Sea and at the Indian border because it believed that foreign governments who are distracted by the pandemic, and now one could argue the US election, would not have the will or ability to push back at this time. Now, what credence do you give to this theory? I think it's a, 
probably right. I think even the U.S. election <laughs> may play into Beijing's feeling that, that well, there's, people are busy with other things. The pandemic in particular uh, is a kind of cover. Uh, and the, all these other problems that Hong Kong and, or what it does in the South China Sea on the Indian border uh, will not be at the top of their foreign policy agenda. Uh, and so under Xi, I mean, Xi already has taken a kind of, you have wolf warrior diplomats and stuff. He's taken a very uh, much more aggressive posture in international relations uh, and, and as, as well domestic uh, enforcement of, of his uh, requirements uh, than his predecessors. Uh, so that that's sort of part of the story, that, that this trend I mean, they were arresting, arresting human rights defenders several years ago. Uh, they, they're making, they're cracking down in Xinjiang, uh, you know, locking up uh, millions of people apparently in these re-education camps, apparently turning the same uh, attention to Tibet, uh, Hong Kong, uh, the Indian border, uh, South China Sea. Uh, I think trying to muscle uh, countries that it, Beijing provides uh, economic benefit to uh, to comply with Beijing's uh, style of government, with Beijing's wishes. So all these things are are occurring, uh, and so it it does make sense that probably uh, there's a feeling, and I would say even the current U.S. administration, which which is up for an election today, uh, that that these things uh, are are making Beijing feel that it can perhaps. Uh, uh, seize the opportunity to do some things, uh, or at least the Chinese leader Xi Jinping can do some things that he perhaps uh, has wanted to do uh, to better secure Beijing's position uh, while others are, are distracted. And I'm just wondering now if you can tie all these points together. In the conclusion of the book, you give an overview of your own personal views on the political turmoil and what you feel is at risk of being lost in Hong Kong. Can you just briefly sum up your concerns and where you see this heading? Yeah, I, I think, you know, one thing I would emphasize, my stance is not anti-China. Uh, it's actually, in my view, pro-China. I'm, as a, a scholar and an expert in this area, I'm trying to paint a picture of alternative things that could be done uh, and ways that, that Maybe the problems Beijing perceives that those of opposition and and protest and so on are are very much a consequence of of its own uh, policies and, and practices in Hong Kong and the way it relates to the Hong Kong government and the way it deals with the issue of autonomy in Hong Kong and so on how it perceives opposition in Hong Kong that that if it uh, adapted more to what the requirements of an open society are, uh, a lot of the things it imagines it's trying to contain by passing this national security law could be solved. I don't think Hong Kong people want to go on protesting if they have a sense that they have a government that serves their interests. Uh, and, and I think they, they recognize Hong Kong and China have mutual economic interests uh, and so a good relationship between those two parts of China would, would be a good thing. So I, I think that's the, the spirit in which I, I suggest my views on it. And, and I think it would be. It, it involves, in fact, uh, I'm very much impressed with the five demands that were made during last year's protest, uh, that those really, if they were listened to, would put Hong Kong on the path to resolving this problem. Uh, and at the same time, uh, this national security law really has no place in Hong Kong. Uh, does Beijing even have the political capacity to change course and do something different? I guess uh, the cynic in me uh, doubts that, that it probably won't. Uh, so maybe we're stuck with hoping that they will stop overusing it. Uh, so far, they seem to be using it, and, and they, they've paired it with local public order laws, they seem to be using these, these methods to suppress opposition rather aggressively, uh, going after legislators, going after just about anybody who wants to run for office, 
going after the media that opposes uh, Beijing. I mean, this is real authoritarianism. It's right out of the authoritarian playbook. And I, I would hope that they, they could adapt. And, and that's why I start the book and I end it with this analogy because I know a lot of the readers will be outside of Hong Kong. Hong Kong people don't need to be told that Hong Kong is a major international city like New York or London. But a lot of outsiders may not know as much. But I think Hong Kong's reputation is so substantial that it stands in a league with those other two cities. And as such, it's a great international asset. It's an asset to the world for finance, for trade, for culture. It, it, it owns one of the corners of the world in, on many fronts. Uh, and as such a resource that's cherished, I think China uh, carries on with this aggressive policy at its peril. Yes, it may cause Hong Kong to submit. Perhaps uh, more Hong Kongers will take up the British offer of living in England. Uh, at least about three million of them have such an offer in front of them because of uh, new actions taken in London. Uh, and that, I think, would be a tragedy. So uh, it's not just about human rights in a narrow sense, but it's about preserving one of the great cities of the world uh, and a city that I think, pe I, I know people have never been there, but they get it. <laughs> they get that this city is, is a treasure. It, it's, it's, it's different than, it's not an ordinary city. And that's why I think even if they destroy it, it would probably not be just another city in China. It could be worse situation. It could be, uh, one of these border regions like Xinjiang or Tibet, where repression uh, exceeds even that in, in mainland cities. So this is a tragedy I think uh, the book tries to, to think about and, and perhaps invoke uh, the kind of thinking that might result in a change of course, uh, and that this would be greatly in China's advantage, because what it's doing in Hong Kong, I think, is creating real problems for China's reputation across the board. Uh, it, it, it can do, you can do things in some small town somewhere, maybe nobody will notice it. But if you destroy Hong Kong, everybody will notice it. And I think that's, that would be uh, not in China's advantage because all the data tells us that Hong Kong is the entrepreneur for, for a lot of investment in China because its rule of law and basic freedoms are so cherished. And I would say just even the people who do these investing, people uh, from abroad like yourself who live in Hong Kong, uh, you know, live there because of these things. They, they choose this place to engage in the activities that they, they're engaging in because it really is this global city uh, that uh, the shining light on the hill, as someone would say, uh, and that it's a place that 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 they would like to live, uh, where in a way that many mainland cities may not qualify. Yeah, I think the picture that you paint is not the most hopeful, but you do give us a reason to be hopeful that you know Hong Kong will be cherished and preserved as the international, global, really special place that it is. Um, Michael, I've taken up a lot of your time, so just before you go, I'm wondering if you can tell us what you're working on now. Well, what I, I started a project before situation got bad in Hong Kong. I was at the Wilson Center. I'm still a global fellow there, as you noted. Uh, and that is looking at the crisis of democracy across Asia. Uh, and so I, I kind of, that all got put on the back burner as I uh, wrote a report and then a book on Hong Kong. Uh, and I'm hoping to get that back in place because uh, that a lot of the problems, we see that in Thailand even th now as, as we speak, a lot of this uh, contest between either populist leaders or military-inspired leaders uh, across our region uh, have, have made uh, the survival of democracy difficult. And so as a sort of constitutional democracy scholar, uh, human rights person, uh, I am trying to assess how uh, people who are establishing democracies uh, should go about it, uh, what they should do, what's important, what makes it work. 
a lot of those things are the very similar things that the basic law tried to guarantee in Hong Kong. Uh, it's not a, a perfect blueprint, but it, it was an attempt at that. Uh, and uh, the emerging democracies in Asia face these challenges. We see that in Myanmar, we see it in Thailand, Indonesia, Sri Lanka. We're really, I teach a course on this just about uh, across the region. And some of the countries that we admire uh, offer lessons that I, I try to incorporate in my analysis, countries like India, Japan, and South Korea, and so on. So, so I, I'm trying to pull together an analysis that is region friendly on how democracies succeed. That certainly does seem like very pertinent work. Um, and hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll be able to have you on again to speak about this work on the crisis of democracy across Asia. It, yes, it does seem very, very important. Um, Michael Davis, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I very much enjoyed it. And uh, I look forward to seeing what you managed to capture out of our discussion. Thank you. Now, I've been speaking with Michael C. Davis about his latest book, Making Hong Kong China, The Rollback of Human Rights and the Rule of Law. I'm Jane Richards, and you've been listening to the New Books in Law, a channel on the New Books Network. Michael, thank you for your time.